So it's good to be back in Atlanta, and especially at uh, Chabad in town, where, just to give you a, an understanding of the specialty or the specialness, the uniqueness of this particular place, as I was walking up to the uh, lectern, I asked Rabbi Shusterman, I said, oh, you know what? It would really help for my talk. Would you have a copy of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? And he said, yeah, I got one in my office. So this is going to factor into the talk. But I don't know if you know, there's not too many shuls where you could get that. And that's a very special thing. Um, and of course, we know about the incredible work done here at uh, Jeff's place for the recovery community and how it is seamlessly blended with the spiritual program that's done for the, the broader community here. So yes, this is a special place, and in case you notice it, I'm telling you as an, an out-of-town guest, this is a very special place. Okay. So really, to start off, I want to tell you something about uh, a Jew in recovery. I, I had a conversation a few years ago with a young man who grew up in a somewhat observant Jewish home. Uh, they, they observed the holidays and, and Shabbos. And um, he would say the prayers in Hebrew. He'd been to a religious school. And uh, he drifted away from that. And long story short, he, what they call uh, in recovery, he hit bottom. He hit rock bottom. His life was falling apart faster than he could lower his standards. And um, he eventually came to a program called Alcoholics Anonymous. 12-step program, the original 12-step program, and they told him he has to have a higher power. He wasn't really sure what to do about that because as far as he was concerned, he didn't have a very good relationship with, uh, with the God that he was raised with. In fact, when they told him to do the fourth step inventory and write his, his resentments, he said, my number one resentment was God himself. So, uh, at any rate, there's a, there's a saying in recovery, which is, uh, take the steps and you will be contacted. And that's what happened. He, he followed instructions, he took the steps, and eventually he did receive that call. He felt that God, as he understood him, had reached out to him. And that became a very real feeling for him, this feeling of having a, uh, a real relationship with, with Hashem. But uh, he had a little dilemma. He told me that it's coming up the, the high holidays, and he cannot bring himself to go to shul because... He said what he learned about God in the program, meaning in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, he said he, he learned how to pray. In fact, prayer is one of the 12 steps. And uh, it says very clearly in uh, step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. So he, he pointed out, he said, look, the God that they raised me with didn't work out very well for me. The God that contacted me after I found the rooms of recovery they tell me here how to pray, sought to prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. He says, I can't go to shul and daven that Hashem should give me a good year. He says, that's toxic for me. I'm going to go in there with my laundry list. He says, that's, that's my, my alcoholic thinking. 
that wants to get in touch with God because I feel like God works for me and he has to answer to me and he has to give me my checklist of needs. He says, that, that's, that's how I was drunk for all those years. My, the, my, my sober relationship with God is when I pray, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. The minute I flip it and I start telling God what I need, instead of asking God what I'm needed for, I'm going to get drunk. I'm bringing this out, not because I think everybody here can necessarily relate to it, but because everybody probably should relate to it. Because it's a really good question. And it's a question that I don't think necessarily everybody thinks of, which is, is that what it's all about? You're supposed to come to shul on the holiest day of the year and tell God what you need? You're supposed to tell God, here are my problems, come fix them? That's what the holiest day of the year is for? You know, Chassidus explains the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, the inner dimension, the mystical, spiritual teachings of the Torah, explain that the real significance of Rosh Hashanah is uh, what we call uh, a hachtara, a crowning, a coronation. That we're crowning Hashem as king. Or like we say in the, in the prayers, we say, we actually say, Malaych Allah Oilam Kulay. We say to Hashem, rule over the entire world. So the point of Rosh Hashanah is we're telling Hashem, you're the king. We're accepting your authority. In other words, we work for you. So then how do you reconcile that with the popular notion? the way that most people experience it, and the most people think of it, is asking Hashem to work for us. When you see people at high holiday services who are praying and they're crying and they're, they're getting all emotional, what, what, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're asking for their needs. They're talking to Hashem and saying, that, you know, help me with, with health, help me with my children, help me with my finances. They're struggling with this area of life or that area of life or, or a relationship that needs mending or, or some type of a, a challenge in life that, that's persistent, that's nagging. And they're pouring out their hearts and they're crying and saying, Hashem, help me. But how, how do we make sense of that? Are we there to coronate God and tell God we're here to work for you? Or are we here to tell God, this is what we need, and we want you to work for us? And my friend in recovery was saying, for him, it's really got to be that I'm here to tell Hashem that I work for him. And the minute I start telling Hashem how he's got to work for me, that's going to start a very unhealthy cycle. I, I, I write in, um, in God of Our Understanding, which was... The book I wrote on, uh, I think the, the subtitle is Jewish Spirituality and Recovery from Addiction. And it's about Jewish spirituality and recovery from addiction. But I think I wrote in the introduction there that there's, a, there's an old Yiddish saying that the Jews are like everybody else, only more so. And I, and I, and I said, addicts are like everybody else, only more so. That addiction is sort of like the human condition writ large. It's an exaggeration of the struggles that all human beings have. So at any rate, I'm pointing out this struggle of this fellow in recovery because I think, even though it's not a conflict that most of us relate to, because it's a conflict that takes place in recovery, then it is a, it is a conflict that really we should all relate to, but we might not automatically relate to it on our own, and that's why I'm trying to emphasize it and bring it out, and I hope you can relate to the question. Even if you never had the question before, if you had the question before, then you're good to go. If you never had the question before, I hope in the past five minutes I, did, I adequately summed it up and you can relate at least to what the dilemma would be. Or at least you're sympathetic to someone else having that dilemma. Okay. So I want to tell you what I told this guy to help him to be able to go to Shul and Rosh Hashanah as a sober alcoholic. I told him that on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, the, the Haftorah reading 
is the first chapter of Samuel, the book of Samuel. And it tells a story about a Jewish woman named Hannah, or in English they say Hannah. And, uh, but I'll say Hannah. And Hannah is the mother of Shmuel, or Samuel. Hannah was barren for many years. And uh, her husband, his name was Alkona, he used to go every year to the Mishkan in Shiloi. That's the tabernacle or the sanctuary that they had before Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. There was a temporary structure called the Mishkan. It was in a town called Shiloi. In English, I think they call it Shiloh. Shiloh, like a Civil War battle? Right. Yes. Probably shouldn't mention it down here, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know which side won. I don't even know which side you guys are on. I don't, I don't want to talk about it, actually. I'm going to stay out of that. No politics in sure. <laughs> so at any rate, Hannah goes to Shiloi. I'm going to call it Shiloi. That's the Hamish way to say it. So Hannah went to Shiloh. It sounds so much better than Hannah went to Shiloh, right? <laughs> Hannah went to Shiloh. Hannah went to Shiloi. And uh, she was davening. She was praying. And what was she praying for? She was barren. I told you she was barren. So what do you think she was praying for? To win the lottery? Well, what was she praying for? To have a child, of course. Yeah, it's not a trick question. She was praying to have a child. Okay. And it's interesting. When she's praying to have a child... It describes, she makes a, a deal with Hashem. If you're going to give me a son, if you're going to give me a son, I'm going to give him to Hashem all the days of his life. You're going to give me a son, I'm going to give him to Hashem all the days of his life. Okay, so who's the son for? Hashem, yeah. Khan is saying, give me a son so I can give him back to you. Very good. This is such a pleasure to be in the Bible Belt, where we can learn some scripture and everybody's getting it the first time. Okay. That's right, so Hannah is davening for a child, but she says right there what the deal is, she wants the child to give the child to Hashem. So Hashem should give her the child she give, so she could give the child back to Hashem. Okay. Now what happens, and this is what we read the first day of Rosh Hashanah in Shul. There was a Kohen Gadol, the high priest, named Eli. In English I think they call him Eli, but we're going to call him Eli. And he comes in and he sees her. He sees her davening. It was when she was uh, praying and Eli observed her mouth. He, saw her, he was looking at her mouth. Why? You know how Jews pray? At least the, uh, the main prayer, the Shemina Esther, the 18 blessings. Silently, right? Where does that come from? comes from here. She started it. Hannah is the <coughs> one who started that. The concept of silent prayer. She was the first one who did it. That's why we do it. We do it in emulation of her. It's interesting. When you see Jewish men praying, they're praying in a way to emulate the way that a woman prayed when she wanted to become a mother. So, since she's the one who started it, when Eli saw it, he didn't recognize it. He didn't know what that was. Today, if you see a Jew praying, moving their mouth and not making a sound, you know what that is, because we've been doing it that way for a few thousand years. But before that, nobody knew what it was. 
So he was, he was watching her mouth, thinking, what, what's going on here? And Hannah was speaking to her heart, meaning she was speaking in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk. Eli. Eli said to her, Ad Mosai Tishta Korin, how long are you going to be drunk for? Hasiri es Yenech Meeloich, remove your wine from you. Vetan Chano Vetaymer. Chana answered him and said, Lo Yadaini, no, no, my master. Ishak Shas Ruach Anaychi, I'm a broken hearted woman. Vyain Vishaycher Loisha Sisi, I didn't drink any wine. The Eshpeich es nafshi lifne Hashem. I'm pouring out my soul before Hashem. Al titen es amoscha lifne bas bliyoyil. Do not deem your maidservant to be a base woman. Ki meiroiv sichi vechasi dibarti adheno. Because it's with much grievance and anger that I've spoken until now. V'yan Eli v'yemer. Eli answered and said, Lechi l'shalem, go in peace. Ve'lekei Yisrael yitain es shaloseich, and God, the God of Israel, shall grant your request, asher sho'alt mi'imai, that you requested of him. What's going on in this story? If you know anything about the laws, the actual laws of the Mishkan, or the Mikdash, the sanctuary in Shilai, or the sanctuary they had in the wilderness for 40 years, or the temple that was built by Solomon. There are laws that regulate what happens in those buildings. You can look it up. Maimonides has chapters and chapters all about it in his Code of Law. And he talks about uh, the prohibition against being drunk there. In fact, it originates from a story, I'm sure, Many of you are familiar with the story of uh, Aaron's two sons that entered into the Holy of Holies and they died. And one explanation is that they had been drinking, which is why immediately after that story, Aaron receives the, the commandment from God that the, the priests are not to imbibe wine when they're serving. And based on that, we have a, an eternal mitzvah that no one is allowed to uh, be drunk in the temple. If you learn that law and you understand that law, this story doesn't make sense anymore. Because if Eli thought that Hannah was drunk, he would not have entered into a conversation with her. He would have had her tossed out of there immediately. Immediately. They had security in the, in the Mishkan. It wasn't, a, it wasn't just a place everyone, anyone can wander in. And there were regulations. A drunk person would have been thrown out of there immediately. So we have to reapproach the story when he says, how long are you going to be drunk for? He doesn't mean that she is actually intoxicated, that she actually is chemically inebriated. Because if that were the case, if she were literally chemically inebriated, he would have thrown her out of there. So then what's he saying to her? He's saying to her, you're in the holiest place in the world. You're in the place where heaven meets earth. And standing here in God's presence, rather than being in awe of the spiritual presence of this place, what are you doing? You're talking about yourself. You're self-consumed. You're drunk. Not chemically drunk. We all know what a dry drunk is, right? A dry drunk is somebody, they don't have to take a drink in order to be drunk because they're not emotionally sober. They're self-consumed. They're completely blind to 
how to be of service, how to be useful to others. Because in that alcoholic way of thinking, before they even touch a drop, they're obsessed with how to meet their own needs. And when you, once you're obsessed with how to meet your own needs, you'll use anyone and anything in order to meet your needs. You'll even use God if you have an opportunity to do so. So Eli was telling Hannah, you're coming into the holiest place on earth and you're obsessing on your needs and you're using God to meet your needs like he's some butler. You're drunk, meaning emotionally drunk. You're not emotionally sober. So that's what Eli told Hannah. What did Hannah tell Eli? She says, no, 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 you got me all wrong. I'm a woman of a grieved spirit. I'm brokenhearted. I'm not coming here making demands. I came here to offer Hashem a deal. I asked Hashem if Hashem would give me, and you all know because we read it before Eli came in, what did Hannah ask Hashem to give her? To give her, not a child, to give her an opportunity to give Hashem a child. So whose child is it? And who's this prayer for? It's for Hashem. So she explains to Eli, you think I'm here with my laundry list, you think I'm here making demands, you got it all wrong. No, to the contrary. I came here asking Hashem to allow me to serve Him in this way. I want the opportunity to give Hashem a child. So when Eli heard that, he said, oh, very good. Continue. And in fact, what you're asking for, Hashem's going to give you. She flipped the whole thing. He thought she was self-absorbed. She realized, no, this whole thing was about service. This whole thing was about her desire to give to Hashem. He, he, then he understood, not only she was not emotionally drunk, spiritually drunk, but to the contrary, she was completely sober. She was thinking selflessly. And he told her, that's good, continue. And you're going to get what you asked for. So, I, I told this young man, the, the young man who was conflicted about davening and shul, I said, this is what Jews all over the world are going to read in Shul on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. It's a story about a woman who asked Hashem for one thing, for the opportunity to be of service, for the opportunity to do God's will. Ailey suspected that she was there to ask to make her life better, and ask for selfish things, but she clarified that, that she was there to serve Hashem. And we read this every year, we've been reading it for thousands of years. And then I said, you know what, if you look in the big book, you're right, in the, in the 12 steps, it does say, Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to, to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. It's true, it says that. I said, but you got to read a little further, a few pages further. A few pages later, when uh, it's actually describing step three, which uh, three is even before 11. Step three is the, uh, the surrender. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. That's the surrender. It's interesting, when it describes how to take step three, it includes a prayer. I've been asked by many people, by the way, Jews in recovery, whether, whether a Jew is allowed to say the prayers from the big book. There are prayers that some people say in meetings that come from other religions, and that is problematic. But the prayers from the big book itself, it's not a religious text. And uh, I encourage people that if they connect to these words, to, to use these words. At any rate, 
with step three on page 63, we were now at step three. Many of us said to our maker as we understood him. And here, the, uh, the co-authors of the big book, I have to apologize because when they wrote their prayer, I guess they sounded, they thought it sounded more holy to use some archaic language. And they kind of used some of that uh, King James type of uh, pronouns. So it sounds a little bit grating on our ears, but you'll get past it. Okay. Here's the, th the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee. Okay, that's th to thee. <laughs> to you, to you, okay, to you. To build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. I'm going to make it normal English. God, I offer myself to you to build with me and to do with me as you will, as you please, as you want. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. Okay, so you, you get the, the drift here, the first couple sentences. This is a prayer of surrender. This is a prayer of giving myself to God. I'm not setting the terms. I'm surrendering to his terms. That was not a Civil War reference. Can I joke about that? Is it too soon? Okay. Yeah, as long as it's a joke. It's just a joke. Okay, it's just a joke. Okay. It's clear from the first two sentences here. I'm surrendering to God. I'm giving myself to him. He's the one calling the shots. But l listen to the rest of the prayer. And this is what I pointed out to this young man who was very conflicted about being in shul with a bunch of people who were praying from a book that talks about uh, having a good sweet year. He was afraid to ask God for a good sweet year. He thought it would get him drunk. But let me continue the prayer here. Take away my difficulties. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now you're giving God orders? All of a sudden it flipped. You were surrendering to him to do whatever he wants. Now all of a sudden you're telling him what to do? Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of your power, your love, and your way of life. May I do your will always. You catch it? Take away my difficulties. Yeah, you're asking God to give you an easier life, a better life. Whatever it is that you're struggling with, health, money, family, help me God, take away those problems. You can't, like Hannah, you can't have a child. Give me a child. But not for me. Not because it's better for me. But because it's better for you. Give it to me so I can better serve you. That's what Hannah said. She said, this child's not mine to keep. This child is mine. That It passes through me and goes straight back to God. And all I'm asking for is the opportunity to be of service in that way. So I, I showed him the third step prayer. I said, listen, it all depends on why you want a good sweet year. If you want a good sweet year because you want a good sweet year, yeah, you're right. It's probably toxic for you and it'll probably be a downward spiral toward taking a drink again. Because once you start getting selfish, you don't know where it's going to end. But if you want a good sweet year because you are God's servant and when he gives you a good sweet year, you can serve him better. And you can be a better example and a better role model and get other people to serve God. Then whose good sweet year is it? Is it yours or is it his? You know, our uh, forefather Abraham, he had a similar uh, situation. Going back to... Uh, we read from the book of Samuel, now we're going back to the book of Genesis, the very beginning. Parshish Lech Lecha. Interesting story here. Hashem tells Avram, Lech Lecha, leave. Leave, your, leave the land where you're living. Where are you going to go? I'll let you know when you get there. And he comes to Canaan, Canaan. He says, this is where I want you to settle down. And the minute he gets there, what happens? Famine. 
What's he supposed to do? Stay there and starve? He can't stay and starve. He has to leave. So he goes to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. And uh, here's the problem. See, Avram was 75 years old when this story happened. And he'd been a monotheist since he was a kid. In fact, he was kind of famous for it. He smashed the idols, and King Nimrod wanted to execute him for it. And ever since then, he was going around telling everybody about God. There's really one God. You've got to worship the one God. So he had a reputation as the big monotheist. Everybody knew it. And then he obeys God, this God that he's always talking about. He obeys God, and he goes to the land of Canaan, and he gets there, and he gets hit with a famine. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you think that that shook Avraham's faith? No. No, it did not. You think Avraham felt that if he listens to God, everything has to immediately work out well in a way that he can see? No, he didn't think that. He didn't shake his faith. So he had to go down to uh, Egypt. And... uh, He had to do whatever he had to do. But it's very interesting, after he's on his way back, he comes back and he's rich. There's a whole story there. Sara got abducted. The Pharaoh had to release her and he had to pay uh, damages. So he comes back from Egypt and he's wealthy. And uh, tells us something very interesting here. Yeah, the Yal Avram. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Genesis 13:1. The Yal Avram in Mitzrayim, who the Ishtai, the Cholasheloi, the Light Imei Hanegba. It's describing. He was called Avram at that point, not Avraham, but Avram. He was coming up from Egypt with his wife, also with his brother-in-law, named Lot, or Light. The Avram Kovid Ma'id, he was very heavy, laden. That means he was rich. He had a lot of uh, wealth at that point. This is after the payoff from, from Pharaoh. The Mikna, the Kassav, of Zahav, he had cattle, he had silver, he had gold. That was the wealth in those days. The Yelech Lamasa'av, and he went to his travels. He went according to his journeys. Minagir from the south. What does it mean he went according to his journeys? Obviously, however he went, those were, that, those were his journeys. It's a little bit funny. And you know that there's an incredible economy of language in God's word. There are no redundant phrases. So Rashi, the foremost commentator, he jumps right on that because he, he went according to his journeys. I mean, obviously, whatever way he went, that was his journey. So Rashi explains and says, he went according to his journeys means that on the way back from Egypt, he retraced his steps and he went to the exact same spots that he had visited on his way down to Egypt. He went according to his journeys means the journey back up followed the exact same route as the journey down there. And Rashi tells us why he did that. In order to visit the same hotels that he stayed in on the way down there, he, stayed, he stopped at the same hotels on the way back. Why? To pay his debt. Because remember, the whole reason he had to leave Canaan and go to Mitzrayim is because he was poor and he was starving. So when he went to the hotels, he couldn't pay them. And now he's rich. He got the payoff from from Pharaoh. So he goes to the same. He couldn't just send them a a PayPal or a cash app. He had to actually physically go to those places. And he paid them back. So there's a fascinating explanation of this from the Chassam Seifer, who was the the rabbi of, of Pressburg, now called Bratislava. And he was a great uh, thinker and leader of uh, European Jewry in the 1800s. So the Chassam Seifer explains that this story has a deeper meaning. When it says 
that Avram went back and retraced his steps and revisited the same hotels so he could repay his debts. He says, it's probably not talking about monetary debts. Because, uh, let's be frank, who was, who was going to extend him credit? No one was going to extend him credit. He's coming, remember, lech lecha means leave your land. He's coming from another land. He's a, he's a brand new immigrant. He just got to town. Doesn't have a state ID. You know, who are you? Can I pull your credit? Like, who are you? So no one extended him credit. The Sam Seifer says it was a different type of debt that he paid. The debt was Avraham couldn't hold himself back from speaking about God, even when his life was a really poor model of what a servant of God should look like in the eyes of people who are skeptical. In other words, at that point in his life, he was not a good advertisement for belief in God. I mean, it depends if you're already a believer. If you're already a believer, then it doesn't bother you. Well, you know, why do the righteous suffer? You don't have that problem. But if you're not yet a believer, and you see a guy who's righteous, and talking about God all the time, and doing God's will, and then you say, well, how did it turn out for you? Well, <laughs> We're starving, and we have no money, and we have to leave the country. We, and we just arrived here, and now we're leaving. Well, that's not a very good testimony to how it works out when you listen to God. There's a Jewish concept and term called Chilol Hashem. Chilol Hashem means a desecration of the name. And it means, if God forbid, somebody who's religious or visibly religious, somebody who you associate with religion does something unseemly, so it's not just a personal disgrace, it, it discredits God, because people look at this person and they associate that person with God. Well, Avraham was a walking billboard for God. And he's stopping at these hotels, and they're asking him, oh, how's life? And he's telling them, that, you know, he doesn't lie, he tells them the story. Well, I listened to God, I left my home, I came to a new land, and now I'm starving, and we have to relocate again. So people were pretty unimpressed. They were like, whoa, well, thank you for warning me not to listen to this God, because <laughs> I don't want my life to also go the way your life is going. Sam Sefer explains that Avraham could not abide by that. That was not going to be okay. His whole purpose in life was to teach people about the one God. He couldn't live with this idea that all the people who had met him on his way down to Egypt might think that if you listen to God, you're not going to have a good life. Now, it didn't bother him. Remember, when he was having troubles in life, it didn't shake his faith. He didn't feel that just because he listens to God, he's owed a good life. It didn't bother him, but he knew it bothered others. He knew that the skeptics weren't going to be very impressed. Or even worse, it could be fodder for them. They could weaponize it. So he made a decision. Now that my life is going well in the way that everyone can agree to it going well, now that I'm rich, I mean, what do people value? Money. So now that they see that I have wealth, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make sure to go back to every single one of those people who saw me when my life was, objectively speaking, from an outside perspective, when my life was not going well, I'm going to revisit them all and show them how it turned out, like Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story. And that was incredibly important to him. This also, this also explains a lot of other things that we read about Avraham. I mean, right in the beginning of, of Parshas Lech Lecha, talking about uh, the previous, I read from chapter 13, so this is from chapter 12, when Hashem tells him, Lech Lecha Ma'artzcha, leave your land. Hashem says, Ve'eschcha L'gai Godol, I'm going to make you into a great nation. Ve'agad L'shmecha, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make you famous. Lifestyles of the rich and famous. Why did Avram care about being famous? Or, I'll flip to it a little bit later. Um, uh, chapter 15, Achad Advarim after the war, when he went to go uh, rescue his brother-in-law, Light, 
to him, and said to him, came to him in a vision and said to him, Altira Avram, don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you. Your reward is very great. Your reward is very great. Avram cares about reward. It's the same question, it's the same answer. Why is Hashem telling this, this selfless spiritual... The, since he was a kid, he was ready to go totally sacrifice himself. He never, he never worried about himself. He only worried about Hashem. And Hashem is telling him, don't worry, this is going to be good, you're going to become famous. Don't worry, you're going to get a lot of reward. Like, how is that congruent? So you have to understand, from Avram's perspective, he doesn't need to be famous. He doesn't need to be wealthy. He doesn't need to have a good reputation. He doesn't need any of that. But he values those things because he knows how people look at him and that he represents God here on earth. And therefore, when he has a good life, meaning objectively what other people consider a good life, that's great PR for God. This, this is what it says here. This is the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee, right, complete surrender, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Right, I'm not in charge. You're in charge at your service, reporting for duty. Relieve me of the bondage of self, meaning total selflessness, that I may better do thy will. I'm here to work for you. You, <laughs> you don't work for me, I work for you. Take away, but then it does that pivot. Take away my difficulties. Well, well, hold on a second. Why, why, why all of a sudden you're making demands? That victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. So that's the prayer. The prayer is, give me a good, sweet year. Give me health. Give me sustenance, livelihood, money. Give me good relationships, a marriage that's healthy and, and, and good relationships with my children and with my, with my family and with my neighbors and my co-workers. Give me a good life and in, in objective terms, a good life. Why? Not because I'm demanding it because this is what I need. But because I've already given myself to you, Hashem. I'm yours. I belong to you. And now everything you give to me is just an opportunity for me to give that back to you. So uh, this young man I spoke to, he did pray in shul that year. And he was able to ask God for a good sweet year and have it be no contradiction with the underlying theme of Rosh Hashanah, of Malay Chala Elam Kulay, where we, ha we ask Hashem to rule over the world. And I think also that year they started after services a, uh, an AA meeting in the library at that shul. So this is, this is the bottom line here. If you're an independent operator, if your life is your life and God is just basically there because you can't avoid him because he's bigger than you, stronger than you, he's got all the stuff that you want, then yeah, it's probably not appropriate to go bother him and ask him for stuff, especially on the holiest day of the year. Probably not very emotionally sober, probably self-indulgent. But if you've given yourself, all of yourself, to him, then what, what can't you ask for? It's all for him. It's not for you, it's for him. There was a, a Fabrengen, a gathering in 770 in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, the Lubavitch World Headquarters. And it happened to have been that that week, a, uh, a rabbi, a Lubavitcher rabbi, had been interviewed on the radio. And somebody, I think it was a caller, or maybe it was the host, 
I don't, I'm not sure, I don't think there are any recordings of this. But the Rebbe spoke about it at the gathering, so that's how it became a famous thing. Somebody asked this rabbi, how come the Torah punishes people for things that are really nobody's business? Like, I understand every society has to punish murderers. I get that. But like something that's your personal business, like Shabbos. I think they, they brought out the, in, in the question, they were like, do you know that in, according to, to the Torah, it says uh, the Sabbath violator will be stoned. I mean, come on, you're going to kill a guy for Sabbath violator? So the, the rabbi was being interviewed, said, well, it never happened. He says, the Talmud tells us that in the times when the court could give the death penalty, one opinion is that if it happened once in seven years, that was considered like a, a bloodthirsty court. Another opinion is if it happened once in 70 years, it was a bloodthirsty court. So he said, basically, yeah, it's on the books. Technically, it's true. But in reality, it, it, never, it was so rare because they would find loopholes how to exonerate people and how to never actually carry out the, the death penalty. So that's what the rabbi answered. So the rabbi conveyed this. And the Rebbe said, you know, he could have answered a more compelling answer. He said the answer was okay, but what did he do? He essentially said, yeah, it's true, but it just it's not as often as you thought it was. The Rebbe said there's a, there's, there would have been a better answer, a more compelling answer, and he could have drawn from recent events in the world. This was back in the, in the 60s. So that week there had been a manned space flight. So the Rebbe said he could have used that as a... As a as an allegory. He could have explained like this. NASA trains astronauts and they spend a lot of money and a lot of time training these astronauts to have this specialty. And they spend a lot of money to build the, the spacecraft and the launch and the whole team, the launch team and everyone, all the scientists involved. There's a lot of expense and a lot of time that goes into it. And uh, so they launched these, these uh, astronauts up into space. And imagine if while he's uh, on, a, on a mission, he's up there in, the, in the, 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 the space capsule, whatever it is, and uh, the astronaut says, oh, I've got a couple minutes free. I've got a break before I've got to do my next thing. And he wants to light up a cigarette on the space capsule. So needless to say, you're not allowed to do that. And to do so would jeopardize the entire mission, and not just all the money and the time and the effort, but even would be a risk to human life. So I'm sorry, Charlie, you're not allowed to light up a cigarette, even though technically you're on your two minute break. So the Rebbe said, he could have said like this, you're asking, how can Torah be so invasive? How can Torah dictate the way that you do private things that don't affect your neighbor? Well, that's only a troubling question if you think you're a civilian. But if you realize that we're all astronauts and we're all on a mission, every single one of us here is on a mission. And when you're on a mission, there's no such thing as downtime. There's no such thing as private time, me time. It only affects me. There's no such thing. Every single moment you're on that spacecraft, you are indebted to everyone else who's involved in the mission and to carrying out the goal of that mission. So don't tell me that it's your personal business. There's, there's no such thing as personal business. It's all for the mission. And that's really what, what it's all about is realizing that we're constantly on duty. There's no, we're not civilians. There's no break from this. We are at service 24-7. Now that sounds so daunting, it sounds so precious, oh, it's too... Hold on a second. Just wait a second. Do you understand the implications of this? This is a beautiful thing. When you 
not only you work for Hashem, you belong to Hashem, then whatever you need to better fulfill your mission, it's His problem to get it to you. And when you ask for it, you're not being selfish. You're not being annoying. Oh, you know, maybe could I get a little bit of this? Go ask for it proudly because it's for the mission. Whatever you need for the mission, ask for it. You need a bigger house for the mission, ask for it. You need a raise this year, ask for it. Whatever it is, if it's for you, don't ask for it. But if it's for the mission, then there's nothing to be ashamed of. Just like Hannah wasn't ashamed. She said, no, you got me all wrong. I'm not here to be self-indulgent. Quite the contrary. I'm here to surrender myself entirely to Hashem. Okay, I'll tell you one last story. I think I told it here before, but it was years ago since I've been here. So I'll just tell you, this one's one of my old favorite ones. And it's about the guy driving down the highway at night. He's all depressed. And he says, God, if you're out there, I want you to know, I hate my life. I hate everything about it. I'm begging you, God. I can't go on anymore with this terrible life. God, give me a new life. And all of a sudden, wouldn't you know it, he hears the voice of God right there in his car answering him. God says, my son, you've asked for a new life. I got a new life for you, right here. Amazing. The guy says, okay, thank you, God. Give me my new life. God says, hold on a second. It's not free. It's going to cost you. The guy says, how much? God says, how much do you have on you? The guy says, uh, I got $20 on me. God says, okay, so the price of your new life is $20, exactly $20. The guy says, but you're going to clean me out. That's what I have. Then I'm going to give you all my money. He says, look at the gas gauge here on this car I'm driving. Like, it's almost empty. I'm going to run out of gas, and I won't have money. I won't be able to get gas. God says, oh, that's a great point. Yeah, I forgot you have a car. The price of your new life just went up. It's $20 in your car. The guy says, hold on a second, God. If I give you my car, how am I going to get to work in the morning? God says, oh, you have a job. The price of your new life just went up. It's $20, your car, and your job. The guy says, God, if I give you my job, how am I going to pay the mortgage? God says, oh, a mortgage, that means you're a homeowner. Great. The price of your new life has now gone up again. It is $20, your car, your job, and your house. The guy says, God, if I give you my house, where are my wife and children going to live? God says, oh, wife and children. Yeah, yeah, forgot about that. The price of your new life is $20. Your car, your job, your house, your wife and children. The guy realizes at this point that every time he opens his mouth, it gets worse. So he's not going to speak anymore. Now he's not going to speak. So God says, taking it all. But before I give you your new life, God says, I'm taking it all, all your stuff. I'm taking your $20 and your car, your job, your house, your wife, your kids, I'm taking it all. But before I give you your new life, I want something else from you. Can you do something else for me? At this point, the guy knows better than to speak. He just says, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. God says, okay, here's what I want you to do for me. God says, see this $20? It's not your $20, God says. It's my $20. You used to have $20. You don't anymore. It's mine, God says. I want you to spend this $20, but it's not your $20. It's my $20, God says. So you have to spend it only on what I would want to buy. Can you do that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. God says, you see this car? You used to have a car just like this. 
You don't anymore. It's my car, God says. I want you to drive it. But because it's my car, you only drive it where I want it to go. You can do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see this job, it's not your job, God says. It's my job, but I want you to show up there every day. And I want you to do business the way I would do business. And I want you to treat your coworkers the way that I would treat your coworkers. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. God says, see the house. It's not your house, God says. It's my house. You gave it to me. It's mine, but I want you to live in it. But because it's my house, when you live in it, you can only use it the way that God's house should be used. See this wife and children. They're not your wife and children, God says. They're my wife and children. And I want you to treat them the way that God's wife and children ought to be treated. Can you do that for me? Mm hmm, mm hmm. God says, okay. So I think we have a deal over here. Here's your $20. Here's your car. Here's your job. Here's your house. Here's your wife and kids. And here's your new life. What's the difference between your old life and your new life? It's the same stuff, just a question of ownership. To whom does it belong? And if we belong to him, our lives belong to him, everything we have belongs to him, then it's all for his glory. So comes Rosh Hashanah, we're going to do two things that are seemingly antithetical, but they're not at all. I hope you see that after I've been speaking so long, how they're not antithetical. Two things that seem antithetical. We're going to give it all away to God. Complete surrender. And we're going to ask him for a good sweet year with health and sustenance and good relationships, and all the things that make a good life, because it's not our life anymore, it's his life. Okay, everyone should have a really beautiful, sweet, healthy, happy new year. Make it a good one, okay.